Well, thank you, Liz, and, and thanks everybody for being here. What Liz didn't tell you in the introduction is that most of the important stuff I learned in life, I learned from people that were SDSU graduates. For example, you might have heard the story about the time the Harvard guy and the San Diego State guy were in a bar together, and they both kind of had to go to the men's room. And when they finished, the guy from Harvard was stopping at the sink and doing this thing, and he said, <clears throat> excuse me, excuse me, but at Harvard, they teach us to wash our hands. And the SDSU guy said, well, at San Diego State, they teach us not to pee on our hands. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to thank you for some of the most important lessons, and they're really cool stuff. Got it. <laughs> Glad you guys are here. The only thing you need tonight is a, a portion of your brain, I hope, and if you can get a piece of paper out and a pen, because we're going to do some fun things together that you'll enjoy writing down. You can, you can use a digital device if you want, but I think you'll find the old analog is more fun. So we'll work our way through that together. Yeah, right out of your way. We're good. All right, cool. Well, how many of you have never been to Nashville, Tennessee, where I live? Never been to Nashville. Well, one thing that people don't realize is that Nashville has its own language. The language is known as Nashville. All right, so I thought we ought to start with a little language lesson so that you don't have any difficulty understanding me as the evening goes on. Uh, how would you pronounce this word? Cheer. cheer. Well, in Nashville, that is a cheer. <laughs> so how's your cheer? Oh, it's so comfortable. Okay, it's uh -huh. outstandingly comfortable. Yes. I like that. Now, as we get a little farther along in school, like around 12 or 13 years of age, we begin to learn grammar. Uh, so they teach us things like nouns and pronouns and whatnot. And in most normal English, the second person pronoun in the singular would be what? Like the first person is I, you, all right? But in Nashville, the singular is actually y'all. Y'all. And the first time I went to Nashville, I'll never forget it, this guy walked up to me and said, hi, how y'all doing? And I looked behind me and I was the only guy there. <laughs> so it's like a weird question to answer. So I tried. I said, well, I all is fine. <laughs> it really sounded bad. So then I said, well, I all are fine, which sounded worse. So I just finally said, fine, you know, kind of gave up. So if this is the singular, how do you suppose you make the plural? No, no, y'all's is possessive. Like, is y'all's cheer comfortable? That's how you'd say it. No, if you want to make the plural, it's really simple. You just throw another all in front of it. All y'all. So, how are all y'all tonight? <laughs> and you could answer by, with the word F-A-N. We're fan. You know, we're fan. You know, so that'll work out great. Anyway, I thought this would be a great evening for a test. Who's down for that? Cool. Now, this will be kind of a, some puzzles, which I hope you'll enjoy. And if you've seen these before, try to keep the answer to yourself and let others suffer in silence. So that'll work out great. <laughs> first, first little puzzle is to go ahead and copy down this well-known word. This is Basane X Leitnateers. Just uh, copy it down in the exact same sequence you see it up there. So it's real simple. B-S-A-I-N-X-L-E-A-T-N-T. Ears, E-A-R-S. Now, clearly, this word is absolute nonsense, but if you will scratch out six letters, you'll reveal a totally common, everyday English word. So that's your job, is to eliminate six letters. Hmm. Anybody like a hint? A little hint? Okay, here, here's your hint. How do you spell the word six? And how do you spell the word letters? So if we spell six letters, then what's left? You win the banana. Yeah, absolutely. So all you got to do is get rid of six letters, and there they are, six letters. And you're left with banana. And now some of you are getting kind of frustrated with me. It's like, well, come on, Dan, this is not fair. Okay, well, was that so much fun you want to try another? Sure. Yeah, bring it on. Let's go for it. This one will be a little bit different. Uh, how many words do we have up on the screen? Some of you are saying, I don't trust you, dude. <laughs> I'm not going to say. Okay, in truth, there are two words there, so please copy them down, new and door. And this time, you don't have to try to eliminate anything. This time, I want you to reorganize those letters. So change the sequence so that those two words become one word. So put them in a different order and get one word. Now, you've got to use them all, 
and you can only use them once. So one word is what we need. Let me see how the back's doing. Hmm. Is it hint time again? Okay, so what I'd suggest you do is start with one of the O's, start with one of the O's, and then go to the N and the E, then use the W, the O, the R, and the D. <laughs> and now you're getting extremely pissed off. <laughs> um, now, by the way, I am rubbish at these kinds of things. I'm terrible at them, which is why it's fun to inflict them on others. So uh, kind of cool. What makes this, what makes this one kind of um, particularly aggravating? <laughs> okay, that's one major thing. First of all, it's a lot like the first one. And the, every time I went through this puzzle the first time, I didn't get it, just like I didn't get the other one. That was not fun. But I was wandering around the room as you were struggling with this, repeating over and over one word. Just need one word, one word. And I could almost read some of your thoughts saying, man, if Dan would just shut up, <laughs> we could get one word. But he keeps wandering around saying, one word, one word. How are we going to get one word? So one of the morals of this story is that uh, sometimes the answer is so obvious that we just don't see it. And humans have a tendency to take simple things and make them complicated. Have you ever noticed that before? If not, try to remember getting out of bed this morning. A simple activity that we sometimes make extremely complex. So it happens that our past conditioning impacts how we deal with everything in life. You learned how to count to six when you were a preschooler. And so when I said six letters, your reflexes kicked in and you started thinking one, two, three, four, five, six. And then when I said one word, everybody knows that one word is a series of letters without spaces between that have meaning in some known language. But when we pop up one word literally, it's like, ah! So I realized that I did some intentional misdirection. Kind of like, these are not the droids you're looking for. <laughs> and it causes our minds to kind of twist around in circles a little bit. So if you want to get ready for your future, it's important to embrace your past conditioning, but don't get locked into it. Because the challenges you're going to face in a rapidly changing future are going to mean looking at things sideways and looking at things upside down and twisting them around into pretzel shape and then figuring them out. So it makes it kind of fun. I've worked with college students for my whole career. And uh, Liz's intro gets me just reminiscing. When we got the letter that I'd been accepted to Harvard, first of all, she said Los Alamos. It's not Los Alamos, California which is up near San Luis Obispo, but I'm from Los Alamos, New Mexico. And does anybody know what Los Alamos, New Mexico is famous for? You know, Nate. What's it famous for? San Alamos Labs, uh, Journey Project, yes. aliens, et cetera. Yes, well, Los Alamos is where they invented the first atomic bomb and where thermonuclear weapons of mass destruction were created for the first time. That's where I grew up. <laughs> and I grew up during the Cold War which meant that we were on the Russians' top 10 hit list. And so if you grew up in a town that you knew you were in the Russians' gun sites and there were five nuclear reactors going around you at all times, what would be your main ambition when you turned 18? Get out, Get out as fast as you possibly can. So I applied as far away as I could think of. And uh, when they said that I'd been accepted, it created an instant problem for my family. And the reason for it is because Harvard's really expensive and I discovered I'd made a huge mistake as a baby. I had forgotten to be born into a rich family. I forgot. I mean, my plan was perfect, but I got distracted and ended up with really awesome parents, but this was out of reach. So my dad did something cool. He wrote a letter and he said, Dear Harvard, and he did it like this. Oh, mistake. Dear Harvard, please send money. Love, Roger. So he wrote Harvard the letter and they replied and they said, Dear Roger, we'd like Dan to come. And so what we're going to do is give him a financial aid package consisting of the following. Number one, a small scholarship. Now, Mr. Moore, it's going to be really small, but maybe he'll study something like microbiology up here. And if so, he'll be able to see his scholarship under our electron microscope. <laughs> it can see the smallest things like his scholarship, but then we're going to give him a student loan of such breathtaking proportions that Dan and his descendants and the descendants of his descendants will all enjoy repaying the loan over the course of their natural lifetime. 
And then because Cambridge is an expensive town, we've arranged a lucrative, stimulating, part-time work-study job right here on campus. And I went, oh, great, I'm going. So I showed up there in the Boston area and I reported to the student employment office and the guy said, what's your name? That's how polite they are in Boston. What's your name? And I said, uh, Moore. He said, Moore. And I said, no, Moore. He said, Moore. And I said, no, it's Moore. He said, Moore, where'd you pack your car? I said, excuse me, what? Where'd you pack your car? You didn't pack your car in the Harvard Yard. Oh and I went, oh my gosh. And a revelation hit me. They don't have any R's in Boston. Or shall I say it correctly, they don't have any I's. And so I found out later after I traveled more what happened to the letter R. It actually got dropped by gravity into West Virginia. <laughs> where people study our first president, George Washington. <laughs> so he said, you need a uniform. So he handed me my uniform, which consisted of, first of all, a white coat. And I thought, this is so cool. That means I'm going to be in the lab working with some famous scientist. And then it went straight downhill. Next item of clothing was a net for my hair, and then a hat made of paper, and then my name tag, assistant to the dishwasher. <laughs> yeah, I was assigned to the dining hall. So has anybody here ever lived in dorms and ate in the dining hall? Do you have that experience? So you finish with your tray of food, and normally you stick it on a conveyor belt of some kind, and it rolls around and you just walk on with your life. <laughs> Did you ever wonder? <laughs> who lives on the other side of the belt? <laughs> yeah. So my job was really intellectual. It was to take the tray of food, scrape the uneaten bit, and hand it to the dishwasher, who was a Portuguese immigrant who spoke no English and who absolutely hated me. <laughs> I mean, have any of you been to a country where you don't speak the language? Can you tell when you're being cussed at? Yeah, so I didn't need to speak the language to know he didn't like me at all. And it was another student who lived in that same dorm that ended up getting me involved with Southwestern Advantage. So that was over 40 years ago. And what's really a lot of fun from that first summer to today is seeing that although colleges have changed, the interests of students have not changed so much. And so I thought we'd do what Monty Python would advise and go to something completely different. <laughs> and we'll get beyond college for a little bit and see if we can pull the lens back and try to think about your far-flung future. So we're gonna dream a little bit here together, and this is called Dreams for Your Lifetime. So first question, how many of you think you have a pretty good imagination? Because you get to use it during this exercise. I want you to pretend three things before you start. Okay, the first thing to pretend is this. Pretend that you already have, today, all the money you're ever gonna want the rest of your life. Now, I do not know how big that number is. It's probably fairly substantial. But just pretend you've got it. It's there. Number two, pretend that you knew right now you're going to live to be 120 or more years of age. And when I talk about living 100 years older than you are now, I'm not talking about the rickety, doddering kind, like the end of Godfather Part Three, The guy's sitting on the stool and the wind blows. He falls over and dies. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about going scuba diving or hang gliding on your 100th birthday just because you want to. So a fun, older age. And then finally, for this little exercise, are there any engineers in here? Good news. You don't have to be logical. <laughs> and for those of you that were raised to always say, be practical, throw that out the window. So don't be realistic or logical or practical. So everybody cool with the rules? Tons of money, tons of time to spend it in, and you don't have to be realistic. So if these things were true on your paper, write down all the things you'd do the rest of your life. All right, let's pause now just for a moment. Does everybody have three or four or five, some number written down? Okay, cool. Without revealing what you've written down, because these are really personal things for you, what are some of the feelings you had as you began to build your list? Excitement. Excitement, really powerful feeling, yeah. What else, different? Anything hit you? I actually felt really selfless at certain points. Okay, selfless. Selfless. Like now you could do some things for others. Exactly. Yeah, which is a really cool feeling. Good. What other feelings, anybody? Anybody feel a sense that the pressure was off? <laughs> How do you spell relief? You know, that kind of thing. Really, really neat. Now on the other hand, 
and I've done this several times, did you begin to write something and you kind of stopped anyway? Like, oh no, that one won't happen. Well, how about this? No, I don't know if that one's legal. Uh, you know, I mean, we, we kind of put the brakes on. The reason we do that is because, again, our past conditioning teaches us to think what's possible and what's not possible, and we end up restricting our thinking. So let me try to give you the method behind the madness. Uh, thinking, first of all, about money. Why do you suppose I recommend that you already imagine you have money before you dream? Any ideas? So you already have the capital to build or do whatever you want. All right. So it empowers your dreams, okay? With that, what would you say? No, you're less restricted. Okay. Less restricted. Well, let's say I didn't put this on the list. What would many of us have written down first? <laughs> Go get money. Number two on my list, get more money. Number three, need more money. And then you'd look at it and say, but I'll never have that much money. Game over. In other words, listen, when I was in college, this was kind of a joke to think about. Because my ambition financially was to someday be only broke. If I could only be broke, it would be so sweet. Because when you owe money to everybody, <laughs> broke looks really good. I owed money to everybody. And so the thought of and it's like, ah. But I want to encourage you to think about something maybe a little unusual. I do believe that money is important to empower your dreams in many cases. But I also believe that the most important things in life, the things you will remember on your deathbed, had nothing to do with money. Mm -hmm. To know that you are loved and to love someone else is without price and cannot be purchased have some idea of what's going to happen when you die. Costs no money, but it's an important question to think about. But to do lots of things for other people and for yourself and your family sometimes does take a fair amount of money. And so here's my question. What comes first? Is it the money or should it be the dream? I'll share a couple of examples with you. One was a guy that started Harvard the same time I did. But I don't think he was a very good student. I actually graduated, and he never did. He dropped out. He dropped out because he was good at playing cards, but the main reason he dropped out is he was also good at writing computer code. And one of the things that he wrote with his buddy Paul ended up starting a little company that we now know as Microsoft. And yeah, Bill Gates never graduated from Harvard. And he actually kind of dresses and looks pretty much the same way today that he did back then. When Bill Gates started Microsoft along with Paul Allen, it was because they had a dream. The dream was that computers should be accessible to everybody. Now, if you've studied a little bit of tech history, any idea who could own a computer back in the 70s? Governments, Governments did? Mm -hmm. Big businesses, really big ones. Universities did. The CIA had a bunch. Um, but the fact of the matter is, for normal people, no possible way. And Microsoft's first mission statement was a computer in every home and in every office. Nobody had ever thought that way before. And so starting from a position of no money and no wealth, we now know today that Microsoft has in fact changed the world. But Bill Gates is no longer involved in Microsoft. He resigned as chairman and CEO so that he could spend all of his time on his nonprofit foundation that he and his wife started. He pulled out a checkbook about 15 years ago and wrote a check for 22 or 23 billion dollars to create the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And they believe that a lot of money spent by smart people and willing to work hard can eliminate all of the reasons that children around the world don't have a chance. Now think about that for a goal. With a billion people every day not having access to clean drinking water. But he believes that that can happen. And he spent some of his time convincing other rich people to give their money away. And the bottom line is, the goal is simple, to change the world. In our society, do successful sports figures and athletes make a whole bunch of money? I mean, ridiculous, stupid amounts of money. But nobody's ever going to know what went through their heads when they were just children, unless you actually talk to them. This is a picture of a little boy in Cleveland, Ohio, who loved to play basketball. He loved to play basketball so much they sometimes had to pull him out of the snow because he'd play basketball in the snow. But I'm not sure anybody understood what he would become. But what I can say is that when he was little, I don't think he held on to the basketball tightly and would say, oh, you want me to dribble? That'll cost 10 cents. Oh, you want me to shoot? Five dollars. 
it wasn't about money. It was about being the best basketball player that he could become. I remember when I was probably seven or eight or nine, this motley group of guys got together in somebody's garage over in England. One was named Mick Jagger, the other was named Keith Richard. And they pulled out these electric guitars and started making horrible noises. And nobody liked their music. They couldn't get recorded, they couldn't get engagements, they couldn't get any money, they couldn't even get no satisfaction. <laughs> <laughs> Terribly sorry. <laughs> But over the passage of time, when somebody dreams a dream, they're willing to work really hard for a long period of time and build alliances and relationships to help that dream happen. You never know what the future will be. These guys just finished a couple years ago their 50th anniversary reunion tour of the world. They're having a lot of fun. Imagine winning a gold medal in the Olympics in basketball or being the MVP. And imagine realizing that you can, in fact, change the world yet again. When I was in Scotland a couple of weeks ago, in Edinburgh, there's a cafe. It's called Nicholson's, a little coffee shop. And up on the second floor, there's a table. And at that table, around 20 years ago, a young woman sat, nursing a cup of tea, and her life was kind of wrecked. She'd just gone through a horrible divorce. She was on welfare, living in her parents' house, and trying to raise an infant by herself. And nursing that cup of tea, she took out a notepad and began writing a story that she'd had in her mind for quite some time. The story was about a little boy whose name was Harry. And Harry ended up going to a very special school known as Hogwarts. Hogwarts. When she finished the book, she knew she had something great. So she carried it to a publisher and said, you may publish my book. And do you know what the first publisher said? No. no. And the second publisher said, no, and the third one said, absolutely not. And the fourth one said, get out. get out. And the next one said, forget it. And the next one said, get out of here. And the next one said, forget it, but I'll give you some advice. Nobody wants to buy a book about magic written by a woman. So she started going by the initials JK and said, this is from someone named JK. And they said, not interested. Went to the next one, said no. Went to the next one, said no. No, 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 no. But I'll give you some advice. Get an agent. So she borrowed money and got an agent. The agent hopefully carried it to the next publisher who said no. And the next one said no. And 26 consecutive publishers said no to Harry Potter. Let me tell you, it is not wise to say no to Harry Potter. <laughs> She persisted and went to a 27th, a little publishing house called the Bloomsbury Press. They read the manuscript and they said, Miss Rowling, we're going to take the biggest gamble we've ever taken in our history. It will bankrupt our company. We're going to lose our shirts. But for some idiot reason, we're going to publish your book. Does anybody know how many copies of the very first Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone were printed? It was 500. Now, you guys can go to Kinko's and print 500 copies by tomorrow. 500 is not a big gamble for a publishing company. Before the Deathly Hallows volume came out, though, number seven, in the U.S. market alone, 10 million copies were pre-sold in cash before it had even been printed. Today, J.K. Rowling is worth somewhere between a billion and a half and two billion dollars. But what's more important than that? is there's not a person in this room whose life has not been touched by the kid with the round specs and his buddies Ron and Hermione and all the rest of them. Five years ago, J.K. Rowling was invited to be guest speaker at Harvard's graduation, and I read the speech. And she said, graduates, you have a pretty cool set of diplomas. But let me encourage you to remember, most importantly, two things. Number one, believe in the power of imagination. And number two, don't be afraid to fail. For she had failed repeatedly. Some of you were raised in environments where failure was absolutely frowned upon, not tolerated. There's all these Facebook posts called epic fail. You know, I don't know anybody in life that has achieved anything that hasn't had a lot of failure and a lot of heartbreak. So don't be afraid to fail. I love the quote from J.K. Rowling. It is impossible to live without failing at something unless you live so cautiously 
that you might as well not have lived at all. In which case, you fail by default. Develop a tolerance for failure. You can't go through life in a Ziploc bag, and it helps you grow. <coughs> Number two, what if you knew right now you're going to live that long? Is that kind of hilarious to think about? Particularly when you're in your 20s, as most of you are. I remember when I was in my 20s, somebody asked the question, and I'll ask you, how old is old? And I mouthed the words, as some of you are going to do, 30. <laughs> 30 is old. My sister's 30. Dude, she's so old. <laughs> well, then all of a sudden, the blink of an eye, there you are. In society, there is this huge emphasis on you got to get everything done when you're in your 20s. I personally believe the most important thing in your 20s is to build a foundation. Because if you're going to have a life of meaning and contribution, build your foundation, your skills, your self-awareness, understanding other people because it's so important. This rush to try to get it all done is partly predicated on the, quote, retirement age. What's the official retirement age in the U.S.? <clears throat> no, it's not 72. 65. 65 and slowly creeping up. All right. But currently, it is 65 years old. Now, where did that come from, that magic number? Well, it actually came in the 1930s. People here know that there was the Great Depression going on, and one of the real tragedies was older people were often completely destitute. And so the government said, people, people, my people, I have good news for you. I have good news for you. And by the way, anytime government says, I have good news for you, hold on to your wallet. All right, really important. <laughs> But they said, I have good news for you. We're going to give you retirement income. All of you. We will. Truly. Promise. Scout's honor. And we're going to begin paying it as soon as you turn age. Hang on. I'll get back to you. Hey, Albert, the actuary. What is the median age of death? Thanks. We're going to begin paying when you become 65. <laughs> That's how government thinks. We're going to pay them retirement income, but when it's time to pay it, half of them will be dead. <laughs> Don't mean to sound like a cynic, but how many of you have begun hearing that the retirement system is in danger of bankruptcy over the next several years? Okay, what, what's the, what are the causes of that? Uh, the baby boomers coming into the age of retirement. Huge number of baby boomers and kind of the baby bust after that. Big factor. But what's the other big factor? Lifespan. Now, some people say, well, people are living longer. Well, I personally think that's not the way to look at it. I just think people are not as patriotic as they used to be, and they are refusing to die on time. <laughs> I mean, if they truly love their country, they'd say, well, I'm 65, I drew the short straw, see ya. Uh, then there'd be plenty of money to go around. But because people are persisting in living too long, my whole point is this. Think that life is meant to be long. More people in this room should live to be 100 plus active years because of what we now know. I mean, think about what we know. We know about something called exercise. We know about something called proper nutrition. The things that used to kill people very young have largely been wiped out. The number one killer in the world in 1900 was smallpox. A lot of you are going, cool, what's that? You don't have to worry about it. It's gone. Right now, the current number one killer is heart disease. And the reason for that is that people are living long enough to contract heart disease. It used to be other things would kill them. And so as we eliminate diseases systematically and we grow to understand the connection between health, nutrition, diet, the immune system, and attitude, the fact that close personal relationships lend to longer lifespan, then you all can practice those lessons and live a really long time. Now, a couple of practical tips. Number one, never drive drunk, shorten your life. And number two, don't date somebody else's husband or wife. All right, that will probably shorten your life also. But otherwise, you can live a long time and dream dreams that might be big dreams. Has anybody been in a restaurant that is symbolized by this character? The Colonel. Interestingly enough, Harlan Sanders had hit a financial setback, had a small business that he had to sell, and went into retirement collecting his Social Security, sitting in a rocking chair. And his wife said, Harlan, quit rocking. And he said, well, I'm bored. And she said, well, do something. He said, well, I can't do nothing but fix chicken. She said, well, then fix chicken. He said, all right. He was making $100 a month from Social Security. 
And he said, this is just not what I'd pictured for my retirement. So he borrowed money and opened a restaurant, and then he opened a second restaurant and another restaurant. And did you know by the time he passed away at the age of 92, that little face was the most recognized commercial image in the world. And he didn't start the business till he was 67. One of my current heroes is right here. His name is Fauja Singh. Now, aren't you a little bit upset that your mother didn't name you Fauja Singh? That is such a cool name. He is a Sikh. Sikhs never cut their hair. They keep it their entire life. They wear it under a turban. And this is a picture of Fauja Singh running in the Toronto Waterfront Marathon at the age of 100. The first time he ran the marathon, he was 92. And he completed it in six hours and 10 minutes. So who in here has never done a marathon? Okay, if you do, don't try one tomorrow in six hours and 10 minutes, you will die. <laughs> this guy didn't even begin running until he was in his mid 80s. And somebody, <laughs> and he was interviewed and, and somebody, said, somebody said, why did you begin running in your mid 80s? And he said, oh, it seemed like a good idea. <laughs> because he finally grew to buy the idea that it made sense. So I'm never gonna feel like the best years of your life are in your 20s. Oh my gosh, you're in the period of greatest uncertainty. <laughs> Look forward to a fun life. One of the great experiences of my life was going across the line in the New York City Marathon at 56 years of age. And I said, this is a gas. So have a lot of fun with what you do. The third one, I hope you enjoyed this one where you didn't have to be practical. Hard though, isn't it? Yes. Hard to not be practical. Did anybody write anything on their paper that is maybe not currently possible? Yeah. Good, good. So why did you do that if it's not possible? Having fun, good, you got the spirit of it. Did you write something that's not possible at the moment? Yeah. Okay, why did you do that? Because um, I really want to be able to ride a zoo animals to work. Riding zoo animals to work, I absolutely love that. Yeah. That is so great. You know why you should dream dreams that are not currently possible? Because if they're not possible today, they probably will be tomorrow. But they never will be unless someone dreams the dream. For example, what are some parts of your everyday existence that were not factors when your parents were your age? Besides you. All right, the internet existed, but it was not something we could access, this World Wide Web thing. In fact, I remember in the 60s, a movie came out. It was labeled science fiction. And you know what the premise was? A computer in the US connected to a computer in Russia, and they were networked. It was a science fiction movie. What else is part of your everyday life? Anybody have a telephone? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Want to see the first mobile phone? A friend of ours bought one and brought it over to show it to us. She walked in carrying this big backpack and she clunked it on the table, boom. And she said, watch this. Hi, Joel, it's Michelle. Yes, I'm at Dana Maria's. I know it's expensive. I just want to show them the new phone. Okay, bye, honey. See you. See ya. She loads it up. I better charge it up. It takes all night, but it lasts almost a half an hour. Isn't it awesome? <laughs> that was it. Now you guys compete. Who's got the smallest and thinnest phone? Hey, man, check out my new phone. It's so thin. Every time I use it, it cuts my neck off. <laughs> Common sense is still lacking despite technology. Does anybody uh, wear one of the, what they call an Iron Man watch that does a little stopwatch timer and stuff? You got one there. Did you know that on your wrist at this moment is more computing power than existed in the world in 1950? <laughs> the bottom line is just because it's not possible today doesn't mean it won't be tomorrow. So dream the dream first. Did anybody write something down like go to outer space? Cool. Why would you do that? Because I've always wanted to. Because you wanted to. Time travel, and see, they might be linked. Excellent, so do you think it's possible for a private citizen to go into outer space that's not an astronaut? It will be. It already is. Yes. It already is. The first guy that ever did it is right here. His name is Dennis Tito. He was a businessman from Utah, and he'd done really well in the money area, but his dream was to go to space. So to get into space, you need primarily a rocket. So he found somebody that had rockets, and he called them up, it was NASA. Hey, NASA, Dennis, what up? <laughs> yeah, I want to go on the next ride. What do you think? And they said, no. He said, well, you don't understand. I got this big old credit card. I'll pay for all the gas and the meals. 
No, you're a private citizen. We don't take private citizens to space. You have to be a trained astronaut. He said, but, and they said, no, but. But he wasn't to be deterred. And so he thought for a minute. He says, okay, hang on. I got lots of money. I need a rocket. Tons of money. I need a rocket. And then hit him. I got it. I'm going to call somebody that has a rocket, but they don't have any money. Any idea what the next phone call was? No, he already called NASA. A rocket, but no money. 20 years ago, it went like this. Доброе утро, Москва. Как вы поживаете? Меня зовут Денис. А, хорошо, хорошо. Я хочу ездить в космос, пожалуйста. Да? Да, а, хорошо, очень спасибо. До свидания. And on the other end of the phone, comradito. <laughs> For 20 million American dollars, you'll go to space. Don't try to trace call. <laughs> 20 million bucks transferred to Russia. He flew over and took off with the cosmonauts, had a blast two weeks in space, and he's going to do it again. Impossible? Dream the dream first. And I got to tell you, some dreams are a complete waste of time. I have a Southern California story for you. This is a true story about Larry Walters, 1982. Larry was an unemployed truck driver. And he used to sit in his backyard in his folding aluminum lawn chair. Any of your parents have some of those? And they fold up and bring them out, and they've got these nylon straps, and you sit on them. Well, he'd sit in his lawn chair, and he would drink beer and dream. And so one day he thought, you know what would be awesome? Is if this chair could float. So he drank a couple more beers, and he said, how could this chair float? And then it hit him. I got it. Balloons. Now realize, this is 30 years before the film called Up. He went down to a scientific supply house where they sell all kinds of stuff, and he bought these huge weather exploration balloons. He tied his chair to the ground, pumped up the balloons with helium, attached them, and this is how it looked. This is Larry Walters in his lawn chair, roped to the ground. Above him are balloons. Now, his goal was to float maybe 15 or 20 feet above the neighborhood and wave at his neighbors and be totally cool. I think he was not thinking clearly, though, when he bought the balloons, because this is the number of balloons that he bought, and that little speck at the bottom is Larry. So many of you are already leaping forward in the story. When he cut the last rope, instead of gently floating to 15 feet, in less than five minutes, Larry Walters was 17,000 feet above Southern California in a lawn chair. <laughs> Now, first of all, next time you look at a lawn chair, ask yourself what kind of steering wheel it has on it. <laughs> None. And what's the air like up at 17,000 feet? Super cold and not much of it. So he's freezing. He can't breathe. He can't navigate. The wind blew him over LA International Airport, the busiest airport in the West Coast, in the middle of the day. And so it was something like this. Yeah, yeah, Tower, this is Delta Flight 209 er requesting clearance to land. Yeah, Tower, it's all good up here. Oh, hang, hang on a minute. OMG, there's a man in a lawn chair. Rom, sweeping out. Can you imagine? Well, eventually, the balloons lost their buoyancy and he settled to Earth, and the police arrested him, and he was given a ticket for violating LA International Airspace without a proper permit. <laughs> Please, some goals are just plain dumb, all right? I used to still have trouble with this one, though. Well, some things just, just can't be done. They're just not feasible. And I changed my story when my son returned as a teenager from a week he'd spend on a mission trip with a church group. Some of you did that when you were growing up. And they'd help a family during the daytime. And then at night, they'd have speakers and presenters. And he said, Dad, we had a singer who talked to us and a guitar player. And I, I got his CD, because I think he'd love his music. And I got his book. So I said, yeah, I want to hear it. So let me play just a little clip here and uh, see if we can get this for you. So kind of mellow guitar flicking. But then I saw the guy's book. What do you notice is unusual about Tony Melendez? Yeah. What you just heard was the sound of a person playing the guitar, 
with his toes. Tony Melendez's mother had taken a drug for morning sickness when she was pregnant. The drug was called thalidomide, and people didn't realize that it could create pretty horrific birth defects. He was born in Honduras with no arms. To me, the miracle is not only Tony Melendez, but it's his parents, because they were advised to give him up, put him in an institution, lock him up. He has no hope. And they said, nonsense, he's our son. So they raised him with his siblings, and I got to tell you, life could not possibly have been easy. How many of you have begun to think in the last 30 seconds, what would your life be like if you had no arms? There's not one aspect of our life that would be the same. But Tony Melendez decided first to learn the piano, so he mastered that with his toes. And then he said, I'm going to learn the guitar. It's a bigger challenge. It's portable, kind of a chick magnet, I hear. And you just heard the results. Pope John Paul II asked him to play a private concert, which he did. He's recorded several albums. He's written two books. He's married. He's got two kids. He's got a great sense of humor. His band is called Toe Jam. <laughs> and the bottom line of it is, once I learned about Tony, I decided there is not a known limit to what people can do. When their motive is right, their heart is right, their faith is strong. Well, we've gone a long ways in the last little bit, haven't we? We've gone to outer space and back. Let me carry you back to kindergarten. We'll close with this. A man named Robert Fulgham wrote a book, oh, probably about the time your parents were your age. And the book was called, Everything I Needed to Know, I Learned in Kindergarten practical stuff like say please and thank you, have a nap in the afternoon, eat a snack, you know, all the stuff you learn in kindergarten. What he had no idea is that the book would make him an international celebrity. It was a huge bestseller. So all of a sudden he's on every talk show, he's being flown here and there, it's kind of a big deal. But Dr. Fulgham was not comfortable with the attention. He just wanted to be a quiet guy that wrote good books. So he said, okay, cancel all speaking engagements, no more talk shows, that's it. But the request kept pouring in. So ultimately he said this, okay, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll speak to two audiences. I'll be glad to speak to kindergarten children. I owe them a lot. And I will speak to college students. Now when I read that, I thought, this guy's so smart. Because this means he could fly into a city in the morning and talk to the kindergarten kids when they've just gotten out of bed. And then he could talk to the college kids that evening when they'd just gotten out of bed. So he'd always have a fresh audience. So he'd start with the kindergartners, and they'd have the kids really prepped for this author. I mean, they'd give them Lorna Dunes and then some apple juice. <laughs> the kids were stoked. And uh, he'd get in front of them, and he'd say, Children, let me ask you a question. How many of you can sing? Does anybody here have little people in your life, five-year-old, six-year-old, four-year-old? Okay. If you ask a wired five-year-old if they can sing, what's going to happen? <laughs> They're going to sing, right? They're going to say, yeah, let's sing. I tell you what, let's do the Lion King. Oh, yeah. I'll be Simba, you're Scar. And they <laughs> kind of go through the whole thing. And then he'd say, that's awesome. You can all sing. Well, how many of you can dance? And they're doing the funky chicken all over the room, and they're swinging him around the place. And he goes, that's cool. Well, how many of you can draw? And the kids would all run to the board and draw a straight line. <laughs> And he'd say, well, what is it? And they say, it's a dog and a ball and my lunch and my brother. And, uh, and, and then they'd tear it off the wall and say, I made it for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, then Dr. Fulgham would take a rest and that evening go to a college campus. Huge hall packed with students. And he would say, students, let me ask you a question. How many of you can sing? A few hands would go up hesitantly. And then you hear people say, well, you sing badly in the shower. Yo, know, well, you sing horrible when you're drunk, you know, and this kind of thing. <laughs> but not many hands. And they'd say, well, how, ma how many of you can dance? A few hands. Well, you know, I got the earbuds. I do this once in a while, but I don't really dance that much. Well, how many of you can draw? A few artists. Everybody else, oh, no, I'm kind of primarily text-based. You know, that's kind of what I do. <laughs> And Dr. Fulgham would look at this group of students and just say, what has happened to you? What happened? When you were five, you could do anything. Now you're 20, you can't even sing, you can't even dance, and you can't even draw. What happened? 
I think we all know kind of what happened. Sometime between little and bigger, we learned this brand new skill. The skill is called how to be embarrassed. Do you realize that babies are not born knowing how to be embarrassed? It is a learned skill, an acquired trait. Babies are not embarrassed about anything. They do four things with great gusto. They cry, they eat, they sleep, and they poop, and they're proud of all of it, man. It's like, look what I did. <laughs> but as we get socialized, people do, don't do this, don't do this, don't, and, we, and we get a little bit... Believe me, I think some kinds of embarrassment are extremely good for preservation of species. Uh, if you find the thought embarrassing to be out there on I-8 playing ultimate frisbee during rush hour wearing no clothes at all, uh, that embarrassment is really good. But let me leave you with a challenge. Try not to let the fear of disapproval keep you from being who you're meant to be. Most of you don't know yet what that is. But I can promise you, once you grasp hold of what you're meant to be and who you're meant to be, you will meet disapproval because somebody won't like it. And I'll share with you what was shared with me when I was 20. If you're not occasionally making somebody angry, you're not really doing anything. You've got to know what you believe and then hang in there with it. I would encourage you to watch who you hang out with because we're all products of our relationships. Try to spend your time with people that bring out the best in you. And we all have friends that do that. And try to spend less time with the people that maybe bring out the worst in you. And we all have friends that do that too. And the more you do that, the more you move toward who it is that you really want to be. So I'm grateful to the LEAD program and the campus leaders that brought you all together. And I appreciate very much all of you for taking a little bit of time to be here with us tonight. Hopefully these ideas are beneficial to you. Just go ahead and dream and make that work. So thanks for making a better world because that's what you're about. Thank you so much. Thank you.